I'm Joe Leary and this is Enjoy Craft. Now the growth of craft beer and distilled spirits has soared exponentially within the past decade and continues to expand to this day. We showcase that world and bring you all that's offered in a bottle, a glass, a can, a growler or a carafe. Welcome to Enjoy Craft. We're at Red Truck Beer Company in East Vancouver, a brewery that started operation in a small capacity in North Vancouver, and then in 2015 opened up this 34,000 square foot facility at the mouth of what was once known as Brewery Creek in the late 1800s. Red Truck Beer Company started on the North Shore in 2005. We were a small brewery uh, with a uh, capacity of about 3,500 hectoliters. Um, over time, we, as we grew our brands, um, we knew that we were eventually gonna build the brewery here um, just off of uh, East 2nd Avenue. And so we built this beautiful facility right from, right from scratch. The building was built to look like a 50 styles warehouse. And uh, you know we bought all new packaging equipment, uh, brand new brew house. Yeah, we have that red truck hanging there. Uh, our owner said to me one day when we were in construction, he was like, you know what, I want to hang a truck. And I was like, where do you want to hang it? And he was like, I want to hang it right in the middle of the brewery. So I was like, okay. So the next morning he came to me and said, I bought a truck. I go, where did you get it? He goes, I got it online. So I was like, great. I wonder what this truck's going to look like. Sure enough, we had a uh, 1960 uh, Dodge Power Wagon show up, flat deck beautiful looking truck so uh, we hung it up and uh, there it is so it's a it's a it's a showpiece and you know what uh, when it comes to branding it's all about trucks and so uh, you know our, we have a lot of different trucks uh, we have some old trucks we have some newer trucks delivery style trucks and whatnot so uh, yeah we're all about trucks and everything that goes along with trucks The property that we're on uh, has a lot of history to it. Um, back in the day, Brewery Creek actually went right through the city of Vancouver. Um, there was a lot of different breweries on Brewery Creek. Uh, in fact, Lion Brewery was just kitty corner to where we're at. This is the original site of uh, Vancouver Brewery. Like, we didn't know that. Um, False Creek actually used to come right up to the back of our building. And so um, the, uh, the mouth of Brewery Creek was just over here, as I said, to the, to the east of our building. Uh, Justin, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here with us. Great to have you here. So Justin, brewing and brewing operations have changed a lot over the years. No longer is it a guessing game with valves and bags of malt. Uh, I see here you have a whole operation automated or mostly automated. Uh, what can you tell us about the, the systems you have here at Red Yeah, Park? we've got a, um, a, a fairly new visualization and, and control uh, software that we use. It allows us to basically monitor any, anything that's happening in the brew house at any given time. Uh, each, each vessel from the brew house, for example, has got its own visualization. It shows you what exactly is happening in there. Well, let's, uh, let's go take a look at some of the operations you have here. Now, this is quite an impressive facility you have here. Yeah, this is our packaging uh, area. We've got our can line right here and then our bottle line on the other side. We only run one of the lines at a time. Uh, we've only got uh, one beer line that services the fillers, so we can only do uh, a single at a time. And also there's common pieces of equipment. So our depalletizer here does either cans or bottles, and our palletizing area is done by hand here, and you can only physically do one at a time. Now, as we were, as we were mentioning, uh, storage is often an issue, especially with a lot of breweries, especially with a lot of growing breweries. Yeah, um, while it seems like we're a very large facility, uh, we've got some, some uh, storage issues as you can see here. So these are mixer bottles that we're going to be putting together by hand and that's going to be coming up next Monday. Okay, let's go see what some of this equipment can do. All right. So 
So Justin, uh, tell me about these gigantic tanks you have in here. Yeah, these are our fermenters. And so these are five brew fermenters. Okay. Each brew for us is 60 hectoliters, so 6,000 liters. Okay. So this is a 30,000 liter tank. Wow. Um, uh, we ferment the beer in here and then transfer it over to uh, packaging. Now, how many fermenters do you have total and how much capacity are you able to actually brew? In this we facility? have 16 fermenters like this and capacity is sort of driven seasonally around there. Fair, fair enough. Um, well, uh, this looks amazing, but I'd rather see the beer out of the tanks. Uh, what can you tell me about the canning line? Should canning we go take line. a look? Yeah. All right. So Justin, this looks like a pretty impressive piece of technology. Uh, yeah. For canning, how many how many cans per minute are you able to do in a canning run, or what does an average canning run look like for Red? Uh, we can do 160 cans a minute, um, and typically we would probably do uh, seven hours of canning uh, once a week. Once per week, and do you find that that meets up with the demand, or in in like, well, like it you were meets saying, up seasonally? the demand right now, and hopefully yeah. in the summer we'll be doing this two or three times a week. What can you tell us about coming down the line for Red Truck? Uh, we just have done a. Uh, incredibly cool packaging and design change. Same fantastic beer that's, that's always been, but a new design on, on all of our packaging. Uh, but I think you'll find that uh, we're gonna do a couple of cool, um, cool things this summer. So Red Truck USA, uh, we decided that uh, we were, we were starting to look at selling beer in the US. We wanted to go down and, and sell some beer down there. Um, Every distributor that I talked to down there was like, um, yeah, you know what, there's enough craft breweries down here. I don't think we really need to bring beer um, in from Canada. So I went to our owner and I said, I don't know if this is gonna work, um, just going across the line. And he was like, okay, then you know what, let's, let's, let's build a place in, in the US. So we went into Colorado, which is uh, really a, a hotbed of craft beer along with you know, Oregon and, and Washington State. But we went there and there just happened to be a brewery for sale. So uh, we bought a brewery there. Uh, we bought all the assets. We didn't buy any of their branding or anything. We bought the assets in the building and we decided that uh, this is gonna be the new home of, uh, of Red Truck, if you wanna call it Red Truck USA. So uh, you know now we're, uh, we're building, um, we've taken the building, the restaurant, we're now turning it into the truck stop diner with what you see here, what we have on, uh, on East First Avenue. And uh, yeah, we're getting ramped up down there and really looking forward to, uh, to getting that going down there. So. We are uh, putting a brew pub and a, uh, uh, a brew pub with re uh, restaurant in uh, the Rhino District in Denver. So uh, that's coming up next after we get the brewery going in Fort Collins. So it's an exciting time for Red Truck and we're really looking forward to uh, uh, the future. So uh, a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of blood, sweat and tears and uh, we're just going to keep it going. The idea behind the Red Truck Beer Company actually started with this red 1946 Dodge known as Old Weird Herald and in the early days it could be found patrolling the streets of Vancouver dropping off kegs of lager and ale to the Toronto Blue Jays single A baseball affiliate, the Vancouver Canadians. Red Truck Beer Company enhanced and expanded its North American operations into Fort Collins, Colorado in 2017 and has since opened a facility in Denver. Coming up on Enjoy Craft, a distillery that's grown from a couple of top selling spirits to now being one of the most popular cocktail spots in Vancouver. And we'll head to rural Mexico and learn about the origins of Mezcal. Located in East Vancouver's Port District, Odd Society combines old world distilling traditions with new world ingredients and ingenuity to create a family of spirits including whiskey, vodka and gin. Twenty thirteen, you opened Odd Society. What was what was the spirit world like in twenty thirteen? It was not a lot happening in Canada, but a lot happening in the US. And that was sort of the inspiration for us was to, I had done distilling in high school and 
started watching what was going on in the U.S. and said, hey, we can do that here. And um, it was just before the big wave. When you say distilling in high school, though, basically you're talking about having a still, correct? Yes. Yeah, so what happened in our house was um, my parents were immigrants from Europe, and for some reason my mother thought that drinking water in Edmonton wasn't up to snuff. So she bought a small still, and she would distill our drinking water. And so then I had three brothers, and so we were making beer and wine, and one day around high school age we spied the water distiller and said, hey, why don't we distill that? So we started doing that. Were there immediate believers? Did people, because th you're talking 2013, right. you're opening up a distillery as craft beer is booming. Yeah. Were people thinking, Gordon, what are you doing? Um, there might have been a few people. I, it was just, you know, I didn't do that much consulting with different people. It was sort of just a homegrown thing. I, I want to do this. And so um, I actually dragged my wife to Scotland. So the year before, or about two years before, and, and um, studied distillation in Scotland, and then came back and started setting up. I used to say craft beer is the new wine. Is it fair to say distilled spirits is the new craft beer in terms of like the explosion in the industry? I guess it would be fair. Um, I, it, it's happening more and more and like when these guys started out here, there, there wasn't anybody else. Um, but uh, yeah, like it's, it's definitely changing and I think the culture around it's changing as well um, as far as people appreciating a, a local spirit. Do the industry term in craft beer is the collab, and you're actually doing that. So you're mixing beer and spirits. How does that work out? Uh, it's interesting because we got to work around um, the laws of being a craft distillery, and that entails using 100% BC fermentables. And so with beer, you've got your options of all sorts of malts from everywhere. Uh, you can get, you know, pale malt from England. You can get chocolate roasted malt. Um, but basically anything that we use has to be grown in BC. Do you find that there's a, I mean the aging process obviously is different for different spirits and in order to be called Canadian whiskey it's got to be three years to the day. Um, what is the shortest turnaround time on a spirit? Um, I mean like I guess vodka, you know we, we pump it through the, the column in the back there and uh, do the stripping run over two days and then um, fermentation's about three days, uh, and then we'll do two runs of hearts out of it, and so seven days before we can put it in a bottle. Does every spirit age, and is there a noticeable improvement in taste in every type of spirit? Certainly whiskey, we know of that, we know of rum, but does gin age, does vodka age? Well, we do uh, both an aged vodka and an aged gin, uh, but their, their time aging is in the barrel, uh, and that's where you're getting um, the biggest results. So we're doing uh, one ounce of fresh lemon juice. Got the Odd Society Bittersweet Vermouth. Some of our creme de cassis. And our wallflower gin. Szechuan bitters is what this is. And this is a vegan foamer used instead of egg whites made here in Vancouver by Miss Better's Bitters. Give it a nice healthy dash. Zing. Oh. Put this up here. Got it. Garnish. in here. Whoop. 
Just a little pinch of uh, dried orange zest on top. Here we are, and this is the gentleman's sour. Founder and distiller Gordon Glanz holds a Master of Science in Brewing and Distilling from Edinburgh, Scotland, where he experimented with distilling whiskey using raw grains and commercial enzymes. Now, as for the name Odd Society, it reflects their interest to use their spirits and distillery as a way to bring together a diverse collection of creative and unique people. In other words, they wanted to make a home where you could feel comfortable revealing your inner oddness. Coming up on Enjoy Craft, we're heading down to Mexico to learn of the origins and the process of making mezcal. Welcome back to Enjoy Craft. Mezcal is a distilled spirit from Mexico made from agave, not unlike tequila, and agave is found in many parts of the country. Recently, we traveled to the foothills outside of Puerto Varda to a remote destination known as Hacienda Las Tres Camelita. It's also where we learned about the making of mezcal. We are high above the town of San Sebastian, deep, deep, deep in the hills of the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico. Now, you have been telling us that you not only brew beer, you actually distill agave here. For those that aren't familiar with agave, that is of course the, the, the core ingredient of tequila. Exactly. But how does agave grow? Agave is grow into uh, forms nowadays. Uh, the old traditional way is that you harvest your agave from the mountain. So you have to know your, your terrain, you have to know your mountain, and you harvest what the nature gives you, not taking advantage anymore because you lose a balance. The, others, the other form you can do it that is more uh, modern is that they do big plantations. But the difference is very real in taste. If you harvest it from the mountain organically, uh, it has a more botanical flavor. If you harvest it in a more industrial way, uh, it has less, uh, less botanical flavor. So, what we have here is a uh, wild uh, source agave. This is the good stuff. Yeah. This is your special bottle. Family, yeah. Fa okay, so you've been in the, in the mezcal business for how long? Uh, as, as in the business, we've been for a short time, about a couple, three, four years. Okay. But uh, as a family, uh, the tradition has run for I don't, I, I don't even know how long. Okay, so just like uh, Italian families will sit down at dinner and have a glass of wine. Exactly. In, in, in Mexican households, is mezcal a, a very common drink? Yes. Uh, our mezcal, made from agave maximiliana, has been, uh, has, has been drunk by, by people, by our, our community for around 450 years. So it's something we take really serious. Uh, we, we do almost like a ritual as a family. We take it... Uh, as something when it's a special occasion, uh, when we want to really, really uh, connect with each other. Now, you know that the, the trend in bars is a lot of times people have shots. Yeah. Is that, that's not how you enjoy? No, bueno. There's two things that okay. uh, old master distillers used to tell, told, told us. Uh, one of those things was to never age our, our mezcal because the plant has already fought weather, fought to get the ingredients for 13, 14, 15 years. So why would you change the profile of, course. of something so precious with wood? That is one of the things. The second thing is that they told us and they taught us, uh, all of us, is how to drink it. Okay, so why don't you show me how to drink it? Now, we have some fine glassware here. Is this glassware generally this is used for mezcal? a special glass we use here in our bar, so we can get a better aroma of our product. Uh, aroma is very important. 
the smell is very intense. Absolutely. Very, very intense to botanicals. And it's part of the experience. Uh, actually, you smell it a couple of times, you get your, your brain going, and when you try it, the experience is much higher. Okay. Now, as you're pouring that, I want to ask you a question. If, if one was to, like, bite into an agave plant, what, what would the experience be? Would they, would they get a little bit of a buzz? When you, when you bake your agave, like, we have the ovens on the background. You can see, but we're, we're actually baking right now. Uh, when you bake it, you make uh, the sugars available. So when you bake it for two or three days, the agave, and you take it with your hand and you bite it, it's almost like a honeycomb. It's all, all agave sugars. It's really sweet, but it's not until you ferment it when you get the, the bust. Now, I noticed you earlier, you, uh, you were smelling before you poured anything. Have you ever just thrown something out going, no, that's not right? Yes. Uh, there's things that can change the profile. Even the plant is good, and the agave is really great. If you don't do the fermentation good, uh, you, you have to know your weather, you have to know your times. There are certain signs of the year that you will have a bad product due to weather. So you can, when you have experience, you can literally know once you smell it when you have a good or a bad batch. I have had such a good time at your estate here. Cheers. Cheers. Hacienda Las Tres Carmelita is also a five-star hotel, offering guests spectacular views that have been described as heaven on earth. And despite the remote nature of the Hacienda, it's actually only 34 kilometers outside of the resort area of Puerto Varda. That is a wrap for Enjoy Craft. We encourage you, as always, to sample and enjoy craft beer and distilled spirits from all across the continent and beyond. But always remember to plan a safe ride home. I'm Joe Leary. We'll see you next time.